May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Ruth and I spent a little while in Norfolk this week. We went up on Thursday and Friday. It was our wedding anniversary on Friday. So uh, we went to uh, a place we love called Holt. Um, and then, you know, as you do, you meet some of your church people there uh, in the car park. Um, but uh, you can't do anything. You can't get away with anything, can you? Um, but the other thing that, that really struck me about Norfolk is, is uh, apart from the signs that say things like, slow you down, um, uh, and uh, get your attention all the more because they say it in the Norfolk way, is that as you go into Norfolk, um, every road you go in, there's a sign that says, welcome to Norfolk, Nelson's County. There's a great pride in Lord Nelson um, in Norfolk. He grew up on the Norfolk coast, first learned to sail there, uh, obviously went on to greater things. Earlier this week was the, the anniversary of the Battle of Trafalgar, but but actually, Nelson's greatest victory wasn't Trafalgar, it was the Battle of the Nile. There, his vice admiral um, took on Napoleon's great fleet um, and destroyed it in a way that made Nelson um, famous throughout the land. And I think Nelson, uh, from the bit I've read about him and the things that he said, had the, uh, the kind of attitude that um, Shakespeare talks about a character having in the play Julius Caesar. He says, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Something that was common and some of the, the people that we admire from the past was that sense of being willing to take the chance when you got it. Of seizing the moment. Whether it was Drake with the Amarda or Nelson time and time again in the battles that he won during the Napoleonic Wars. Seizing the chance. Well, Bartimaeus didn't know it. But this was the last time that Jesus would go through Jericho. He was on his way to Jerusalem to die. He'd been through Jericho time after time on his way to and from Jerusalem as he went south, away or north up to Jerusalem. Time and time again he'd been there and perhaps time and time again Bartimaeus had heard that Jesus was coming. And over time he would have heard more and more and more and being blind and begging at the roadside, he would have heard things that um, people didn't realize he'd heard because he was a beggar. He was blind. And unfortunately, like it still is today, very often, he was ignored. And people would stand near the gate and would talk and he would listen. How else would he know that Jesus was coming? And how else would he know that it mattered that Jesus was coming? There was talk about Jesus. He would have heard about this Jesus. And time and time again, he perhaps let him go past. But this time, he was not going to let him go past. And he starts to shout. And he starts to be probably, well, in fact, he was quite annoying. That happens, doesn't it? You know, you, you get that, don't you? That... Um, you're, you're out somewhere perhaps enjoying you know, a quiet moment and somebody suddenly gets very loud. Whether it's someone talking very loudly in the quiet coach on the train or, um, or in a theatre where you know, people are, are, you're trying to listen to what's going on. Or in a cinema, and, and I'm afraid I have to hold up my hands and my children sometimes were, were, were um, guilty of this rustling in the plastic containers for the sweets or the crisps or whatever it is as the film just reaches that quiet point. Um, and it's annoying, isn't it? Well, he was annoying. And they told him to be quiet because Jesus was coming. Um, they said, uh, 
They rebuked him, said to be quiet, but what did he do? Did he go, oh, well, I better, better be quiet. And no, he shouted all the more. He had to shout above the people saying, be quiet, Bartimaeus. Because he wanted Jesus to hear him. He knew it was important. He didn't know how important that it was the last chance he had, but he knew it was important. Now, he was taking a risk because the people around him, the people saying be quiet, were the very people he depended upon to drop the money where he was begging. But he shouted all the more. The more they tried to shut him up, the more he shouted until finally Jesus stopped and says to the crowd, call him, call him. And so the people who, who'd been shouting, the people who'd been saying, be quiet, suddenly changed. They called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. And they change in a moment just like that. Because Jesus has paid attention to this man who's shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The word son of David were a, a, an Old Testament uh, saying that uh, it was more than just being an ancestor of David. It was someone special, someone who was, who was expected to come. And part of me, had got all this just by sitting at the roadside begging. He'd listened into a lot of conversations. And he wanted this man to know him. And so what does he do? He throws aside his cloak. And he gets taken to Jesus. Now, earlier in, in this chapter, and, and we've looked at it the past couple of weeks here and at Desford, um, we've looked at a rich young man who comes to Jesus but goes away sad because Jesus says, give away all you have. Come follow me. Last week in, in Desford, we looked at James and John, the sons of thunder, um, who came and said, will you, will you make us important in your kingdom? I want to sit at your right and at your left hand. I want everything. And now this man cries out, have mercy on me. And what he does when he throws aside his cloak is he throws aside everything he owns to come and find Jesus. Throws it all away. All he said is, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he's taken to Jesus. You know what? Here is a man of faith. Here is a man who was willing to throw everything aside to annoy everyone he depended upon to come face to face with Jesus. <coughs> it makes me ashamed of how I am sometimes. The compromises I make, the things I'm perhaps not willing to give up to come face to face with him. And then he comes, comes to Jesus and Jesus asks, well, he's... Jesus is, is, is like that, isn't he? He asks interesting questions. He asks the kind of questions that make you think, why is he asking that? So they bring the blind man to him. and He'll obviously be blind. And he's been crying, Jesus, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says to him, what would you like me to do for you? He doesn't assume. He doesn't assume even though he knows. He gives the man a chance to say what he wants. Perhaps we might think the needs are obvious, you know, to, to heal his sight. But Jesus wants to know. Rabbi, or the original word is actually Rabboni, which is a, a little bit more um, someone of a higher status. I want to receive my sight. And he does. All this time he's been crying out for mercy. And now when he gets his chance to stand in front of Jesus, Lord, I need my sight. That's the one thing I need. You know, sometimes, sometimes we cry out to God for mercy. Or we cry out to God to help us. but we're not willing or perhaps brave enough to say to God, this is what I really need. 
He'd never seen any of Jesus' miracles. I mean, it's obvious he'd never seen any of Jesus' miracles because he was blind after all. But he'd heard of what had happened. He'd heard people speaking about it. Perhaps, we don't know, he might even heard of someone speaking about it who had been healed by Jesus. But it was all hearsay as far as he was concerned. But he trusted in Christ. He trusted in Jesus enough that when he stood before him in the middle of all this crowd to say what he really wanted to him. The preacher C.H. Spurgeon writes this. Rest assured that those are the best prayers in all respects, if they be earnest and sincere, which mo go most directly to the point. You know, there is a way of praying in our own room and praying in the family in which you don't ask for anything. You say a great many good things, introduce much of your own experience, review the doctrines of grace very thoughtfully, but you don't ask for anything in particular. Spurgeon says... Such prayer is always uninteresting to listen to. And I think it must be rather tedious to those who offer it. Get to the point. When you talk to Jesus, get to the point. When you speak to him in prayer, ask him for what you really want, because he knows it anyway. Whether you have children or not, you've been around children. And you know that children are very good at asking for exactly what they want. They're very good at persisting also like Bartimaeus, which can also be annoying. But they'll come to the point. As you grow up as an adult, we, we learn to fudge, don't we? We learn to, to beat around the bush. And of course, we're British, so we... We rarely say what we actually think. Um, we say other things. In fact, other nationalities have problems with us over that. Um, because when we say, you know, how was that? Well, it was all right. Doesn't mean what you think it means if you're not British. Um, we beat around the bush. And sometimes we beat around the bush with God. Oh, God, God may not always give us what we ask for. God may may. may give us something else he may give it in a way that we didn't expect or he may speak to us in another way about it but but he longs for us to speak to him directly to say what we really mean to him you know if there's one person you can say what you really mean to it's the person who already knows what you want to say so why not just say it and that's what Bartimaeus did and and he and he's healed Suddenly, he can see. Now, we don't know if he's been blind all his life. We don't know if he, if he, if he went blind through some disease. But uh, he's got to the point where he's begging in the street. But he's healed. And Jesus says something very interesting. He says, your faith has healed you. And he says it as he says it. The man's sight comes back. He says, go, your faith has healed you. He receives his sight, but immediately he begins to follow Jesus on, on the road. Your faith has healed you. He trusted Jesus. He trusted him when all he'd done was hear about him. He trusted him enough to annoy everyone around him. He trusted him. When everything said, oh, don't bother. When the people said, be quiet. It was faith that made him determined to reach Jesus. It was faith that made him cry out, have mercy on me. To know that he could. It was faith that made him say, Rabboni. Even though he couldn't see him. It was faith that allowed him to say, what I really, really want is this and so Jesus says your faith has healed you now it mattered who he had faith in it was faith in Jesus but it was that faith and that trust that he had in Jesus that Jesus says has healed him and he says go on your way well it didn't take very long for him to start disobeying Jesus did it because what did he do he started following him 
He didn't go on his way because he knew that here was someone special and here was someone who had something more than what he'd just done for him. Here was someone worth following. And so he does. And he spends time walking with him from Jericho to Jerusalem. He would have seen the, the enthusiastic crowds as they welcome Jesus into Jerusalem and as the crowds then turn upon him. But now healed and having received mercy, he follows Jesus. Earlier in the chapter, we read that the rich young man had been told, give away all you have, then come follow me. And he couldn't. Bartimaeus throws aside all he has, but receives everything he needs from God through Jesus. And he follows him. Oh, he saw the crowds that, prom that shouted, blessed is the one who came, comes in the name of the Lord. But I don't think he was one of the ones who then went on to shout, crucify him, crucify him, for he followed him. There was nothing wrong with the crowds having the joy. It was the fact that it faded quickly and went away. I may have mentioned before that sometimes I've heard people say that it, it really gets to me. When people say that, you know, someone's just come to faith in Christ. Someone's very enthusiastic uh, about their faith. Someone wants to tell everyone about Jesus and what he's done for them. And I've heard Christians say, oh, he'll soon or she'll soon settle down. Well, in God's grace, I hope that none of us ever really settle down. You know, there's a poem, uh, uh, which is a hymn by William Cooper that says, Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? Long may that reign in our lives, in your life and mine. Oh, yet we can all fall away. We can all fade. We can all settle down. But my prayer is that, that actually we'll have people among us who stir us up. People who are awkward, like Bartimaeus. People who shout, Jesus, have mercy on me. People who say, shouldn't we be doing this? Shouldn't we be doing that? Shouldn't we be? I long for that as a minister. Oh, sometimes God grants that prayer. And I think, oh, why did I ask for that? When someone comes, and, comes yet again and says, what about this? What about that? But you know. I see the grace of God in the folk he stirs up, stirs up for his work, stirs up to do what God wants them to do and God wants us to do as a church. Have we that trust in God that Bartimaeus has? That trust that says to God, Lord, will you? Lord, will you let us share who you really are? Share your grace with the people of our community. I know, you know, that's sometimes easier to think about than sharing God's grace and God's goodness with that neighbor, or maybe that neighbor next door, but one that we find difficult. That person across the road that uh, is always moaning. That person that uh, we're tempted to cross the street and look in a shop window to avoid as they walk past. And rather spend time showing the grace and the goodness of God to them. Let's, as we think about this crowd, let's not be like the crowd. Let's be like Bartimaeus. Let's be like that one who made the noise, who shouted, who annoyed people. And okay, we don't, shouldn't be annoying people just for the sake of it. Um, and I know we all do it sometimes. But, but be willing to, to be loud and to be proud of what God has done for us, of his goodness and his grace and what he will do for anyone who puts their trust in him. Bartimaeus, you couldn't shut him up and Jesus didn't want to. When Jesus said, what do you want? He said, well, I want my sight. But actually he got so much more because then he follows Jesus and Jesus says, your faith has healed you. What's your faith like? What's my faith like? What do we trust God for? What do we depend on him for? God has been gracious and good to this church in ways that sometimes I find hard to take in. 
in all the building work that um, we had to do for the damp and stuff. And I've said to the leaders a couple of times, I think, God keeps giving us more money um, than we really need. Well, at that point we said, well, perhaps there are things we don't know about yet. Um, but God has provided it. God has provided for this place uh, to be in the state it's in after years of being a small church. God has provided people to be part of the work here over the years. But it's in order that God's work might be done. It's in order that we may reach this community for the sake of Christ. So what about you? Will you join me? But more importantly, will you join him in his work? Let's pray.